from the makers of Coldwater Omo. Mrs. Peel looked up from her meal. The door slamming meant that Ulla Monsey Chamberlain had left the house. She'd gone to visit a sick friend in the village, leaving Mrs. Peel alone at dinner. Mrs. Peel tasted the fish approvingly and sipped the wine. Being alone in the huge, rambling mansion didn't worry her a bit, but she was puzzled. Hmm. Kinky. The whole setup is definitely kinky. Particularly Ula. <laughs> I must admit she cooks delicious fish. Perhaps Mrs. Peel was at that moment just a little too self-contained. Had she been more apprehensive, more anxious about her circumstances, she might have noticed that the revolving door at the top of the stairs had been turned round. The illustration of the Joker playing card had swivelled inwards. The Ace of Spades, the death card, now faced outwards. The Avengers. <laughs> John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. So many women say, once an OMO user, always an OMO user. Because there's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water OMO. It solves Mrs. Sutherland's washing problems for her. Very dirty oil or grease marks. Yes. If you use cold water OMO, there's no trouble at all. It comes out very, very easily indeed. There's no washing problem too difficult for cold water OMO. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. Shirley Ann Field chooses Lux for her complexion. I always use Lux. I find it so very rich and creamy, and I love the perfume. Like Shirley Ann, choose Lux for your complexion. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. <laughs> Episode 3 of this story, in which John Steed realizes that someone has played a rather vicious joke on him. And Emma Peel meets a strange young man who could be the Joker. Mrs. Peel didn't know whether to be annoyed or amused at the circumstances in which she found herself. They were unusual, to say the least of it. When a, a young, attractive woman is invited down to a country house for the weekend, she doesn't expect to dine alone on the very first evening. Yet that was the state of affairs in Sir Cavalier Rausikana's home. For her host had gone to attend a bridge conference, and his ward, Ula, had just left. Mrs. Peel, unaware of any hidden danger, finished her dinner, poured herself a liqueur brandy in a balloon glass, selected a miniature cigar from the box on the drinks table and moved off to inspect the rooms on the ground floor. Hmm. I'm the only person here. I could be holding a house party for 50 in this place. One thing is certain, Sir Cavalier has a lot of money. I wonder how he made it all. Mrs. Peel was in the study when the tinkle of a bell sounded from another part of the house. It wasn't a doorbell. It seemed to come from the direction of the servants' quarters. Mrs. Peel made her way towards it, pushing open the green baize door that led to the kitchen. The room was silent when she entered. Above the door to the scullery was a large wooden box that contained bells numbering individual rooms. The spring of the bell marking bedroom number three continued to tremble gently. Had someone upstairs been trying to call a servant? Mrs. Peel frowned and shaking her head, dismissed the idea. She walked through into the scullery. The loud ticking of the clock made her look across the room. 
Her attention was caught by something on the scrubbed wooden table. It was a knife stuck upright into the surface. There was blood smeared all over the blade. I said Ola was kinky. This proves it. She guts the fish, prepares it and cooks it. Cleans away all the mess, but leaves this. I must have been crazy to lend her my car. You're right there, Mrs. Peel. At that moment, Ula, at the wheel of the car, was giggling rather hysterically. <laughs> Ula was making no real attempt to leave the driveway. She could hardly see in the thick fog. Eventually, she parked the car, got out, and started to walk back in the direction of the house, still giggling. Kinky. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in London, poor old Steed was limping about his flat, feeling rather sorry for himself. He made coffee in his kitchen and was carrying it through when the sugar basin containing the lump sugar fell from the tray. Oh, what the devil with it? The sugar basin fell near the stairs. The lumps of sugar scattered over the bottom steps. As Steed bent down to retrieve them, a glint of metal caught his eye. What the devil is this? Small metal box. How did that get there? Fixed into the side of the stairs. Steed pulled the device free from its place of concealment and examined it. He touched the spring at the side and a length of fine trip wire shot out. Hmm. Booby trap. Stretched across the stairs, it's guaranteed to trip up anyone coming down. The moment the wire's touched... Withdraws immediately. So that's how I nearly broke an ankle. Steed hobbled across to the telephone and made a call. George Fancy answered quite promptly. George Fancy speaking. George, Steed here. Ah, oh, Steed. How's the ankle? Oh, much the same, thanks. Uh, George, it's not April the 1st, is it? Uh, what's that? It's not All Fool's Day. Well, of course it isn't. Yes, I thought not. Steed, are you delirious or something? Uh, my fall down the stairs... It wasn't an accident. Someone fixed a tripwire on the steps. Somebody playing a joke on me. Now, look here, Steve. You, you don't mean it, surely? I most certainly do. Stranger should call that little warning about Max Prendergast being in London, isn't it? Steve, you don't think... Well, what about Mrs. Peel? Yeah, that's the reason for this call. Look, I want the address and all the information you can muster on Sir Cavalier Rossicana. Sir Cavalier Rossicana. He's a bridge champion, lives on Exmoor somewhere. Now, get everything you can on him immediately and phone me back, will you? Yes, 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 of course. Uh, but Mrs. Peel... Is visiting him. Now, I must get down to her before some joker gets hold of her, too. You understand? Mrs. Peel decided to retire to her room and read. She found a suitably relaxing book in the library and made her way up the stairs. She passed through the revolving door, swinging the ace of spades after her. In her room, she noticed that the curtains on the four-poster bed had been closed. She switched on her portable radio. To further drop in subsidies to counteract the recent potato glut. That concludes the news headlines. And now, here is a summary of the weather. Oh, dear. Widespread fog is reported tonight in the outlying districts of west and <sighs> southwest England. This is particularly dense in and around Exmoor, where the visibility is down to mid. Oh, this place bed. Oh. Mrs. Peel moved over and opened the lid of the coffin shaped chest. Now, what are all these old 78s? What's this one? Mademoiselle. <laughs> and this? Same. They're all the same. How very, very odd. Mrs. Peel moved to the bed and drew aside the heavy curtains. Oh, a large teddy bear. Ola upped her tricks again. Oh, that's really a hot water bottle. Well, that could come in handy if... Mrs. Peel broke off in the middle of her thoughts when she heard a strange creaking noise from somewhere in the house. She moved to the bedroom door and opened it. The noise was louder. It sounded like a rocking chair moving, coming from a room at the far end of the corridor. 
Mrs. Peel walked stealthily towards the far door and threw it open quite suddenly, feeling for the light switch. Nothing. But the rocking chair, it's still moving. The furniture appeared to be covered in dust sheets. Mrs. Peel was about to uncover them when... The front doorbell rang. Without switching off the light, she ran from the room along the corridor, through the playing card door, and down the stairs. The bell rang again, more impatient at this time. The fog swirled in through the open doorway. Out of it loomed the shape of a man, a young man. He looked a very odd young man. Yes? Yes, what is it? What do you want? Don't you recognize me? No. Should I? No. I'm traveling incognito. It's foggy and damp. And standing there in the doorway, you'll get cold. Look, would you mind telling me who you are and what you want? I could be the Baron von Dufy, looking for a new stately home. I might buy this place. Cash. The entire grounds, fabric and all. It's not for sale. You dot me. But it could be true, couldn't it? You don't know for a fact that I'm not the Baron von Dufy? I neither know nor care. Do you know what time it is? Sorry. It's the jalopy, my car. Over there, down the drive, run out of petrol. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? I can't see a car. You wouldn't in this fog, would you? But it's there. It's your phone I'm after. Big property deal. I want to buy land here, you see. I also want a gallon of petrol. Or I have to walk home. My feet would get sore. Do you have a phone? Yes, there's a phone. Come in. You all alone in this great big house? The phone is there on the table. Thanks. Don't mention it. Why are you staring at me like that? I don't like being stared at. We, Baron von Dufys, are human, you know. The strange young man walked over to the telephone. Emma studied him. He was tall, with long, lank hair, an inscrutable face, and a nasty habit of clicking the fingers of his right hand together for no reason. The left hand was covered with a black leather glove. He paused as he was about to lift the receiver and said, Plastic surgery. That's why you didn't recognize me. Plastic surgery. Had my face fixed. Amazing what they can do nowadays. Will you please make your call? Uh, incidentally, I'm not the Baron von Dufy. He's a much smaller man. Also, he's dead. If you don't make that call... All right. All right. All right. I'll make the call. This is uh, like a movie situation, isn't it? Tender young girl alone in an old house. Mysterious stranger calls. May I use your phone? She admits him. And then, da-da-da-da, the wires have been cut. What are you talking about? It's true. The strange young man picked up the telephone wires and held them out to Emma. They'd been cut all right. Da-da-da-da-da-da! And with a vicious uppercut, Jimmy Anderson finishes trimming his whole hedge in just three hours, 11 minutes. <laughs> Great work, Jimmy. Do you play any other sport? Yes, dominoes. You're looking pretty cool, Jimmy. What deodorant do you use? Shield for sportsmen, of course. Why? It works. Shield for sportsmen deodorant won't stick, sting, or stain. In aerosol or roll-on, it's made to keep sportsmen cool and dry. Think what it can do for you. The cleaning power of cold water Omo gives you the superb cleanness you want from a washing powder. Listen to Mrs. Baxter of Claremont. It really is good, you know. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, really, that, that it could be so good, you know. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. <laughs> Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. Brought to you by the makers of Coldwater Omen.